So let's just go ahead and pray to, pray to get things started. Lord, you are mighty and powerful, good and kind, patient, loving. You want to be known and you want us to know you and you want to know us, Lord. You just want you care for me. You care for everyone here, Lord. And I just pray right now that you just would bring encouragement to this place, that each person here would just feel your presence, feel encouraged by you and the love that you have for them. Help us now as we open your word. Just open the eyes of our heart and help us to see the wonderful truths that you have preserved in your word for us today. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so go ahead and turn to the book of John, John chapter 1. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book of the New Testament, John chapter 1. We're going to spend our time in that book today. And as I was thinking about this, so first off, I'm Josh. My wife, Heather, is over here. We help out with the young adults, and it is a huge blessing to, uh, to us, um, for our whole family, honestly, to be able to have, be involved in the young adults' lives. And so I just would encourage any of you here who are a young adult, who feel like a young adult, who know a young adult, just to, just to come on Wednesday night and get connected with a group. We have them all the time over to our house, and it's just been a wonderful thing for our family. And I said this in the first service, but I, I mean, it's true. It's like Michael always says, we are one generation from losing the faith. And like just pouring into the next generation is so important. It's so essential. It's the way that the Lord has used to propagate his gospel and his word through time. So John chapter 1, um, before we get there, I was actually thinking, so I was back at work, I work at William Murray, I teach there, I was back at work this week, thinking, getting ready for all the students to come back to campus, all the conversations I'm going to have, and something that just, you know, occurred to me, is like, I have so many students coming into my office day after day, just, hey, I need advice for what job I'm going to do, or what, you know, I need a letter of recommendation, or all these types of things. And I don't know how many of you know William & Mary students, but generally, they put forth this aura of, yeah, I have it all together. I know what I'm doing. Like, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to be a brain surgeon, or I'm going to go be the next president, or I'm going to be this lawyer, and like, they have it all together. That's the, that's the aura that they present. And then they come into my office, and they sit down, and they're talking about, like, oh, I'm taking this class and this class, I'm getting a, a B here, and a, what, they're talking about life. And I was like, how are you doing? They're like, oh, fine. Like, how are you really doing? Like, how are you, how's your week really going? And what they realized then is that, is that I'm seeing them as a person instead of just a student. They're, I'm seeing them as an individual who has cares and worries and, you know, heartaches and excitement and dreams and desires, and I'm seeing them as a person. As soon as you say, how are you really doing, the conversation almost always ends in a place where they say, like, I don't really know what I'm doing. So even though out there, they're like, everybody else knows what, I'm, what they're doing but me. And I always tell them, I was like, I haven't met any of those students who know what they're doing. Because I don't know where they're, I mean, they never come to my office. And, but I think that's the truth with a lot of us. It's like, and maybe I feel like as I get old and older, I just admit, I don't really know what I'm doing at all. Like, I just feel like I'm pretending a lot. But what they're getting at is there's these big questions that we all struggle with. Like, how do I have meaning? I want my life to matter. I want to make a difference. Um, what is purpose? What is meaning? How do I know I'm not wrong? How do I know this is worthwhile? Am I worth anything? Like, there are these big existential questions. And for some reason, you're like, oh, that's something you do in college. You ask these existential questions. And I actually am thankful they do, because I think sometimes they're more honest than we are. I think there's an honesty about asking those questions. As you get older, I think life gets busier. You get more worried about how you're going to pay that next bill or, or whatever, that you don't have the room to ask those big questions in life. But then you find yourself, like, you know, sitting by, you know, maybe it's a cold night, you're sitting by a fire, looking at the fireplace, and your mind just starts thinking, like, you, know, you have that, that quiet to start pondering and wondering, like, how do I know I'm not wrong? How do I know this is right? What's my purpose? I feel unsettled. And what the Lord has done in my life, he's just allowed me to basically constantly have those questions, and he's allowed each time those waves of questions come, he brings me to a deeper knowledge of who he is and the peace that he provides. And so as I was thinking about that thought, the Lord drew my heart to John chapter 1. It's where I want to spend our time today. We're going to talk about the calling of Nathaniel, 
Um, so that begins in John 1, 43. And then we're going to kind of bounce around in the, in the beginning part of chapter 1 a bit. But just to get started, um, I just want to read John 1, beginning at verse 30, 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So when we're thinking about this passage, for first off, we're not going to be able to make it through the whole thing. We're going to focus on the first part. We need to understand how John writes. And why did John include this story? So anytime you're reading a book, like you want to understand, like, what's the author getting at? I was, so Kincaid, my daughter, and I were driving down the road the other day. She had a book report. And I was like, oh, what, you know, what did you write your book report on? I remember as a kid, when I wrote a book report, I just kind of like summarized the main points. Like, okay, like think about if you're writing a book report on like a story, like you'd summarize the main points. This is what the, the book report's about. And I remember I turned my papers into my English teacher. I'd get a D if I tried. I didn't try, I got a D, so I finally just like, well, I just don't care. I just basically just always got Ds in English. Because what I, what I finally realized is when I need to write what is this book about, I was repeating the story. Okay, so think about Les Mis, Victor Hugo's Les Mis. You know, it shows this um, story of Jean Valjean. He is forgiven by a bishop, and because of that, he changes his life. And you see him go through a series of relationships where he, um, he is forgiven, he forgives Javert, he's chased by this, you know, this policeman all his life. There's just, this, and I could repeat, I could write a book report. Les Mis is about Jean Valjean, he stole a loaf of bread, he was imprisoned, he got out of prison, he was chased by uh, this policeman Javert because he had broke his parole. I could repeat that. But that's not, that's what the book's about. But I could also write, this is a book about forgiveness, the power of forgiveness. There's a bigger meta-narrative there. And so John, when he writes, so let's flip to the end of John, John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse, let's see, John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That is the point of the Gospel of John. So if you had to write, what is the Gospel of John about? If you had to write a book report on it, you could repeat all that John said, you could summarize it, but the point, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So every story, every narrative, every conversation, every sign points to the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That is the point, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John has a goal. But not only does he have a goal, it's interesting, the first part, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his, the disciples, which are not written in this book. John is aware of many other things that Jesus did that he deliberately chose to exclude from the Gospel of John. So you have like these, they call them the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Synops, synoptic summary, synopsis. They just provide, they provide like a historical summary of Jesus' life. They talk about his parables, the Sermon on the Mount, his birth, his death, his resurrection. They provide a synopsis. John is kind of like over here in left field. Like he has a very different way of writing and a very different way of thinking. And what he does is he cycles like, what I like to think of is between like the mundane and the transcendent. He'll tell stories about like friends, about food, about being hungry, about water, about sheep, about life, about being sick. So he just tells like there's normal stories included, mundane stories. 
but then they transition to the transcendent. They transition to something that causes you to look at, I'm hungry, there's some bread. I am the bread of life. I'm lost. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, the life. So many of these big pictures of who Jesus is, we get from the Gospel of John because he goes from this mundane daily life to this transcendent view of who God is. So we have to be very aware when we're reading one of these stories, why did John include it? He didn't include, you know, the transfiguration. He didn't include Jesus' birth. Um, he did include Lazarus. He did include changing water into wine. He included things that were excluded elsewhere. Like, so he, he picked and chose a very, through the inspiration of God, a specific subset that points to who God is. So, let's, so as we think through that, I want to, as we think through the story of Nathaniel, we must keep that in mind. So what I want to do first is provide a 30,000-foot mm, view summary of this story of Nathaniel, the call of Nathaniel, of um, who Nathaniel is, of how he responds to, um, to the Lord. So Philip, Philip is, was called by Jesus, follow me. Philip starts following the Lord. And then he comes up to Nathaniel and he says, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. John is very rooted in Old Testament writing. And we see that he, allow, he writes, you know, Philip is also rooted in that. I don't know the relationship between Philip and Nathaniel. It sounds like that they probably had some familiarity with each other. I could only imagine they talked like, when is Moses's um, prophecy going to, or when, when is the, the, the Old Testament writings of Moses going to be fulfilled? When are the prophets going to be fulfilled? I imagine they had those conversations. So all of a sudden, Philip comes up to Nathaniel one day. He's like, hey, hey, I found him. Hey, bud, come with me. Like, I found him. He's in Nazareth, the one who Moses wrote about. And something I was thinking about, I know, like, there are many new people here last week, and I see some new faces here today. So first off, I just welcome, welcome to the church. I'm really glad that you're here. I always get the question when I'm meeting people out, just wherever I'm meeting them at, like, they're like, oh, where do you go to church? And I'm talking, and like, oh, I go to foundations. They're like, what's foundations? Like, what, what kind of type of church is it? And, you know, I could describe, like, oh, the denomination or our belief structure. It's like, it's a church that's spirit-filled and scripture-saturated. That's how I describe it. We need, to, we need to hold tightly to the truths of scripture, but we need to let the spirit illuminate our hearts. So I say it's spirit-filled and scripture-saturated. And importantly in doing that, we hold to the entirety of Scripture, from the beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, the whole thing. And you see that here in the book of John. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. It's one story. It's not like there's some weird stories in the Old Testament that are like, I don't get it. And then all of a sudden there's this New Testament part we're going to hold to. It is one story. It's a story of how we fell, how we sinned, and we messed things up how God promised a way, he fulfilled his promise in the person of Jesus, and he is coming back to redeem the earth and make everything right again. So we must remember that this is one story. We're not going to be here and be like, oh, I don't like that part, throw that, that part out. We must hold to the whole truth of Scripture. So when I say, what's this church? It's Scripture-saturated, it's Spirit-filled. Okay. So Philip says, come, you know, we, I found him who Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? There's like, he's just like oozing contempt and scorn for Nazareth. He's like, there's nothing good there. Nazareth is this like this backwater, you know, place that is looked down on in Israel. And Nathaniel's like, no, like you look like it's not, I mean, Jesus is supposed to come from Bethlehem. We're supposed to be the, the land of the kings. This is not where he's supposed to come from. And it's interesting here that I was thinking about this, you know, reading about this. And, um, you know, you, you see in Matthew, he will be called a Nazarene. There's this, that's what Matthew says. He will be called a Nazarene. And so then you look in the Old Testament. Where, is, where does it say he will be called a Nazarene? There's a couple different ways you could you can, uh, try to slice and dice that, whether it's there's one thought about vines and, and, you know, what the actual Hebrew word and... That, you know, I'm not going to go down that whole path, but one thing that I you know, saw a commentator say that I think is really good is to say he is from Nazarene, he's a Nazarene means he is one who is scorned. He is one who's looked down on. He is one who is held in contempt. 
And you see that in uh, Psalm 22, you know, he'll be rejected by men. Like there's a, there's a rejection to be from Nazareth because you're just icky. You're just low down. So what's interesting is when, Na when Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? In some sense, he is fulfilling or validating the Old Testament prophecy that he's going to be scorned and he's going to be rejected. Nathaniel says, I'm rejecting you because I'm holding you in contempt. Okay, so he goes, he decides anyway, he's going to come. And so he comes, oh, lost my place. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus saw Nathaniel coming. Uh, Philip said to him, come and see. So Nathaniel, despite the fact that like he didn't look highly on Nazareth, he's like, sure, I might as well go see. Go see what's going on. Go see, go check this place out. So he goes and checks it out. And as Jesus sees him coming, he says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now we know from the end of chapter 2, John chapter 2, verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus is able to look into Nathanael's heart and he sees Nathanael for who he really is. And he says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He's a man of integrity. He is truly seeking. Now, it'd be easy, like my first reading, I'll, I'll be honest with you of this, I wanted to put Nathaniel like in my mental box of a Pharisee. That's what I wanted to put. Oh, he's just one. He's just an Israelite who's trying to check all the boxes. And if he checks all these boxes, then he knows he's going to be right with God. Jesus doesn't call him a whitewashed tomb like he calls the Pharisees. He sees him as something different. He sees that there's a truth. There's an integrity inside of Nathaniel that is really seeking at what matters in life and is really seeking truth. And in seeking truth, Nathaniel doesn't know yet. He's actually seeking Jesus. And so I was, you know, pondering this and considering this. I thought I could, oh, I could go on and talk about the fig tree. But I wanted to loop back around to this question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because I think this is like the core question of the day. This is, this is the question that really gripped my heart this week. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I think it, it prompted a couple things in my heart. First off, Nathaniel goes despite the fact that he thinks Nazareth is a place to be scorned. Why does Nathaniel go if he thinks Nazareth is such an awful place? Why does Nathaniel go if he's like, nothing good comes from there? But he goes still. And what I think was, I think it's kind of like, you know, my students who they come to my office and they pretend they have it all together, but when they're honest with themselves, they're like, I don't know what's going on. I'm unsettled. I'm searching. I'm hurting. Some, I'm missing something. And I think Nathaniel is missing something. He's unsettled. His heart is not at peace. He, he lacks that purpose, that drive, and that, that push to to keep him going. I was reading, Viktor Frankl is a, he was an Austrian psychologist. Um, he was imprisoned during Aus in Auschwitz during World War II. And while he was there, he observed many people um, suffering the, the horrors of Auschwitz, saw many people die. Um, and his question that he pondered for the rest of his life after leaving Auschwitz wasn't, why did anybody die in Auschwitz? He knew the answer to that. It was because of the horrors of Auschwitz. But his question that he pondered the rest of his life was, why did anybody live? How can you live after seeing the horrors of Auschwitz? That was the question he pondered for the rest of his life. And he wrote many books on it and, and considered that question deeply. And the conclusion he came to was the reason anyone was able to persist despite the horrors that they experienced was because they had a purpose. There was something beyond them that they were able to hold to, to keep them going. They had a purpose, something beyond themselves that said, that's the reason I'm living for. And I think that might be what Nathaniel's struggling with. He's like, what's, what's my purpose? I'm missing something in my life. I'm, I'm just bouncing around. I need something. And when you don't have a purpose, you're hurting. There's, there's a hurt in your heart. So first off, the first observation is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel goes, despite the fact that he scorns it. And I think that shows that there's, there's an unsettledness or an emptiness in his heart that he's longing to fill. 
The second thing that I was thinking about, can anything good come of Nazareth, um, is I don't know how many of you all have ever seen the movie Homeward Bound. I don't know if y'all, like, Homer Bat, okay, probably weren't expecting that reference. Okay, I have, like, you know, my kids are, like, you know, almost 12 and under. Um, we're watching Homer Bound. It's a quick summary. A boy lost his dog. That's the, the main plot. The boy is looking for his dog, and the dog is looking for the boy. All right, so you have this boy and this dog running around looking for each other. That's basic summary. And it's really sad, like, and as a kid, you see both sides of the story. You see the dog side and you see the boy side. And you see so many points in the movie where they just they pass by each other. They're just like, he's just one valley over. Or he's one street over. And, and as a kid, like I'm sitting there with my kids, they're like yelling at the TV, like, shadow, shadow, he's right there, he's right there. Like, like they want them, like, and what's happening is the viewer knows more than the characters. And us as the reader of the book of John know more than the character. Right. So can anything good come out of Nazareth? You as the reader want to like yell at Nathaniel, like, yeah, Nathaniel, something amazing has come out of Nazareth. Something really good has come out of Nazareth. Something that's just going to blow you away and change your world and change everything you thought about yourself and the, the people around you. So my question that I wanted to ponder today is, what does the reader know that they want to yell at Nathaniel? What is that... Thing that they know that they're just like, if Nathaniel only knew this, it would change the way he thinks. Why did he check it out? So what I want to look at today is a little bit at the prologue of the book of the Gospel of John. So let's look at chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, so the Gospel of John starts off with this idea, in the beginning was the word. Now, the actual word that for word is logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. Now, that logos, that word logos, I, you could read books on it and try to unpack all the meaning in it. There's, there's a lot of um, depth. It's a very full, rich word. I'm not going to be able to go through all that today. But one thing that you need to understand is that this idea of logos is rooted in Greek thought. There's a lot of Greek thought, particularly Stoic philosophy. Philosophers have been thinking, you know, before Jesus is coming, they developed this body of thought surrounding the Logos. What is the Logos? Um, and when, you know, just like us, these Stoic philosophers wanted to feel like they had meaning. They wanted to feel like they had purpose. They wanted to feel like they had an identity. And what they came to the conclusion of is our purpose in life the way that we develop, develop meaning is if we align ourselves with the logos. And the logos that they had was this view of this, the rational order of the world and the universe. And so they said, we need to find out how we fit within this rational world, of the rational order of the universe and the world. And in that ordered world, there's beauty. And we find purpose and meaning by aligning ourselves with that. That's what they believed. And so from that idea, we get this idea of, oh, you're just being stoic. Being stoic really means just being kind of resigned, being resigned to where you are. So stoic philosophers thought, like, our goal isn't to strive for something better or to desire something better. We are simply going to be resolved or resigned to the path that we are given. And that's, where, that's how we're going to find meaning. Um, and I think there's a lot of that, like, you know, you can see, like, okay, you know, that kind of is propagated through to today. William Mary campus all the time. Buddhism is the really big thing there now. We need to just really align ourselves with, with the world. Buddhism says, you know, the chief enemy in the world is desire. We need to get rid of desire. And if you get rid of desire, if you just be, I'm just going to be, then I'll feel peace. Well, what's really weird about that, if you think about it, their chief desire is to get rid of desire. So they're desiring to be rid of desire, which is kind of like a self-defeating thing. But this idea is still really prevalent today. And so it's into this world, into this 
place, John writes these statements. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And this Word, this text falls on the people of the day just like like a thunderbolt. I mean, it's just revolutionary to them at that time that this idea that the Logos isn't an organizing principle of the world, the Logos is a person. And so here, Greek philosophers, like, you have to, like, it's easy as Christians just to dismiss everything. Like, oh, they're not Christian. Like, there's a lot of wisdom and insight they had, but they're just off. They're off by a bit. And the way that they're off is that John writes, he says, the Logos is a person. Yes, you need to align yourself with the Logos, but the Logos isn't this rational principle of the world. The Logos is the person who created the world. The Logos is the person who existed before the world began. And he said, and this Logos was God, and he was with God in the beginning. He is light. His essence is to be known, to reveal things, to reveal things in you, to reveal things about himself. And now... um, you know, as I was thinking about that, one thing I, I was reading, this, he's an atheistic philosopher, um, and he wrote this statement, I wrote it down here, it says, to claim that a mere mortal could constitute the Logos was insanity. In a few lines of text, John invites us to believe that the incarnate word no longer designates the harmonious structure of the, con- co- of the cosmos, but refers to a simple individual. And this is just amazing. And what I love about reading sometimes, you know, atheistic philosophers is like they don't have a Christian, you know, agenda. But he sees it clearly. He says this text in the Gospel of John uprooted all that we thought we knew about ourselves and the world. Christianity just came and changed things completely. And what it's saying is it's saying the purpose of your life is to align yourself with the Logos. Now, I could end there. I was like, initially in this week, I was like, I could end there, and I could be like, okay, so are you fulfilling your purpose? What's your purpose? But you know what the problem of purpose is? And you know what the problem of me ending there would be? What's the problem of purpose? Think about it for a minute. You really think, what's the problem of purpose? I just heard, told you that Viktor Frankl, in his Man's Search for Meaning, says we need purpose. But there's a problem with purpose. Okay, so consider a watch. I, have a, I don't have a watch on, but imagine I had a watch on. I look at it, and that watch isn't keeping time. I say, it's a bad watch. Okay, the goal of a watch is to keep time. If a watch is keeping time, it's a good watch. If the watch is not keeping time, it's a bad watch. Purpose creates a standard. I now have a standard with which to evaluate my watch. The purpose of a watch is to keep time. It's a good watch or a bad watch. We all have a purpose. And as soon as you recognize you have a purpose, you automatically have to admit that you have a standard. There's a standard by which you will be evaluated by. So it'd be easy. So if you think about the world, this is why the world hates the idea that we are created for something or we have a purpose. You ask any, you know, most you know, people today, oh, you just do you. You find your own meaning. Live your best life. Whatever makes sense to you. There's this idea that like you're going to just define your purpose. And the reason for that is as soon as people feel like you are saying you have a purpose, they realize, I can do, I'm either bad or good, and it creates a feeling of shame. And shame is like the number one enemy out there today. Like, I don't want you to make me feel ashamed. I'm going to do whatever I want. What right do you have to tell me that I can't do this? I don't want to feel ashamed. You need to validate me. You need to support me. And it all comes back to this idea that if we have a purpose, there's a standard, a standard that we can live up to, or standard we can fail. So what is our purpose? What does the Lord say our purpose is? Let's look at Isaiah 43, verse 6. Why did the Lord even make us? There's a lot, that's a big question. We spent a lot of time on that. Isaiah 43, verse 6. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory whom I formed and made. There he goes. He says, all right, whom I created for my glory. You are created to bring glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I think it is. Let's see. Yes. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
the purpose of our lives is to bring glory to the one who made us, to the one who formed us, to the one who called us sons and daughters. That's the purpose of our life. So I could end here and I'd be like, okay, are you fulfilling your purpose? Are you bringing glory to his name in everything you do, whether you eat or drink? And honestly, like, I'd not be the first one to admit, I sure am not. Like, I'm not fulfilling that purpose completely. So you could leave here feeling challenged and feeling, oh, like, I'm just not quite, I just need to do a little bit better. But as I was, as I was, as I was thinking about this, Dean and I, my son, were actually sitting on the floor doing a puzzle one night. And um, just listening to praise and worship music. And the song called Shalom came on. I really, it was just great. And it's just, just what I needed at the time. And it was just was talking about how he will bring peace. And I was thinking about Viktor Frankl and his idea that our chief desire in life is to have meaning. And I, I, I thought about it and I said, well, close but not quite. Close but not quite. Because I think our chief desire in life is to have peace. That full shalom, that full flourishing and rest and hope and joy, that is what we want more than anything. We want that shalom. And sometimes we find it by aiming at purpose, but when you really recognize we're actually aiming at peace. And so we desire peace. We desire this full shalom. And I think that's what Nathaniel really desires. I think he's unsettled. I actually think that's probably what was happening under the fig tree. I think there's some intimate, something, Nathaniel some, was having, I think, some type of existential crisis. I think something went wrong in his life. And I think he was, he was, it was a very raw, emotional, deep experience he was having. Something that he didn't want other people to witness. And Jesus said, I saw you there. I saw you at that point when you were under the fig tree, when you were at your lowest, when you didn't have peace, when you didn't have purpose and you were unsettled. And so I, was, so I think Nathaniel is struggling with the same thing that many of us struggle with today. You know, maybe you go forth in your life and you're just, I mean, the older I get, the busier I get with all these kids running around everywhere. And it's just like, but then when I finally just in the car driving quietly by myself, I'm just like, my mind starts going. And sometimes a feeling of unsettledness creeps in. And I have to ask myself, you know, what do I do with that? And so as I, as I thought about this, um, the Lord really drew my heart to the baptism of Jesus in the first chapter of John. So let's look at John 1, 31. I myself, this is John the Baptist speaking, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. I had read over this. Like, I had read through the chapter, you know, John chapter 1 multiple times. And I had saw this, you know, portion here. And my mind just very quickly placed it in the category of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is just, this is his, his baptism. This is just a story that's included in the other gospels. But then I had to stop. I'm like, why did John include this story? Why did John decide, this is the story I want to include? He didn't include the story about Herod. He didn't include the story about the wise men. He didn't include um, the story about, he didn't include Mary's Magnificat. He didn't include any of these other things in here. Why did he include this? Why is this the story that he decided, I need to put this in the Gospel of John? And as I considered that, my mind was drawn back to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. That's a direct you know, connection, directly connects you back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We see that in this creation account, water is covering the earth. It's chaos. Water is represent of unformed, of entropy, of chaos, of, of evil, of destructive of power, of raw power. And we see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Presumably, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters so that he's going to bring peace. He's going to bring order amidst, amidst the chaos. He's going to bring order amidst all the destructive force of the water. So we see the Spirit hovering. My mind was drawn to Genesis 7. Genesis 7 is the story of the flood of Noah. 
And the flood continued for 40 days on the earth, Genesis 7, 17. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole earth, heaven, were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubics deep. So again, we see water covering the face of the earth. Bring your mind back to the creation account where there's just chaos. There's just this destructive force that covers everything. And you can imagine, so here's Noah in this ark, looking at the ark thinking, this is what I'm surrounded by. I am in the midst of the most unsettled place I could ever imagine. So the water starts to subside in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 6. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth the raven. It went forth to and fro until the waters were dried upon the earth. Then he sent a dove. And remember, the dove always represents the spirit. We saw that in John. And he sent forth a dove from heaven to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot. And she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and he took her and he brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening. And behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf, a sign of peace. So no one knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. I remember always being super confused by this story as a kid. Like, here I am, a kid, reading the story. I got really worried about this dove. Like, where does this dove go? <laughs> right? I mean, here it says, he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. Like, where did this dove go? What happened to this dove? And as I thought about it, no one knows that this dove has found a place of rest, a place of security, a place of peace amidst the chaos that surrounds him, amidst the world around him that is just in utter disarray. He knows that out there, the dove has found a place of rest. But the question still remained to my childish mind, where did the dove go? And this week, as I just considered it, John 1 Verse 32, and John bore witness, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. It's as if the, the dove, the spirit, flew across 2,000 years of history and 100 pages of scripture. Noah released this dove and didn't know where it went, and it landed on Jesus. It landed on Jesus in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. and says, this is my peace. So while Noah was in the ark thinking there is a place of peace out there, the real truth is that there is a person of peace. There is a person who promises to bring peace to each of us, who promises that in the midst of whatever we are going through, he will bring peace. God fulfills his scripture. He, brought, he made that promise to Noah through the rainbow. And he fulfilled that in Jesus and said, this is my anointed. He is the person. He is the great logos, the one who existed before the world began, the one who spoke the world into existence. And it is through him that I am going to bring peace. And so in, in my clothes today, I could... You know, I could have had this thing where, oh, like, you know, just, just try harder. You know, just, just fulfill your purpose. And you know what? That probably would keep you going for a little bit. Like, that probably, you'd probably be like, okay, I'm going to do better this week. I'm going to try harder this week. But the Lord just pressed on my heart, don't offer a challenge. Don't offer a challenge of something that you should do. I want to offer a promise. It's not my promise. I couldn't fulfill anything. It's a promise of Scripture. It's the Lord's promise that he promises to bring peace. He promises to fulfill everything he said. This is one story, and he promises that he will make all things new. I'm going to read in Revelation real quick. Revelation 21, 21 verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. 
So these are trustworthy and true words. These are words that you can stake your life on. And he said to me, it is done. There is coming a time when God is going to make everything new. He's going to make all your pain come untrue, and he's going to redeem this creation. And he is doing that. He has begun his work through Jesus, through his promise that says, this is one on whom my dove hovers but also remains the person of peace. So my question for you today isn't, are you fulfilling your purpose? My question for you today is simple. Do you have peace? Is there peace in your heart? When you're sitting at home quiet, when you're driving down the road, thinking, when your heart is quiet, is your heart at peace? And I don't know where you are at, whether you, what anxiety you're struggling with, what discouragement you're facing, what despair you feel, what depression is assaulting you, um, what fear seems just to overwhelm you. The promise of Scripture is true as it was then, it's true now. He is our place of peace. He is the person of peace, and he comes to bring that to you. The only thing he needs from us is to admit our need of him. The only thing that we must do is say, Jesus, I need you. He says in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We have a heavenly father who is good, who overflows with goodness, who never runs out of goodness. We have a heavenly father who achieves all of his intentions, a heavenly father who is a place of rest amidst the storm. We have a heavenly father who is a shield for those who meet their need of him. The only thing we have to do is admit how much we need him and receive him. Let me pray. Lord, I need you more than ever. I need your peace. Please just encourage everyone here. I just pray that your spirit would just bring peace in a way that surpasses understanding. When we doubt and when we say, Lord, how do I know? How do I know you're real? How do I know this is right? How do I know you're using me? Lord, I know because you give me a peace that surpasses all understanding. And so, Lord, I just pray over my brothers and sisters here now that you would give them a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that doesn't make sense to the world, a peace that is inconceivable in light of what they are walking through, Lord, but a real, substantive manifestation of your peace in their life today. Encourage them, give them strength, give us strength for this week ahead. For whatever we face, we know that we are not facing it alone, but we have you with us. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that you fulfill your promises. That you fulfilled your promise to Noah, that you fulfilled the promises to us, Lord. We thank you for your love, your patience, and your kindness. In your name we pray.